Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the great debate on the Republic. Should Australia become a Republic or not? That is the question for this evening. I am Georgina Downer. I am the CEO of the Robert Menzies Institute based here at the University of Melbourne. We are a Prime Ministerial Library Museum in honour of Australia's longest serving Prime Minister, Robert Menzies, who himself was a very, very staunch monarchist. But we are not going to take a side. The Robert Menzies Institute is um, impartial in this debate, uh, although, of course, Robert Menzies would not have been. Uh, it, um, it, we have held this debate tonight, of course, because over the weekend, most of you would have, I'm sure, been glued to the television like me. You watched the coronation of King Charles III. Uh, Robert Menzies, as, a, as the Prime Minister of Australia at the time of the Queen's coronation in 1953, 70 years ago, he attended, of course, and was part of the official procession. I've told this story many times before, and I know a few of you in this room have heard it, but um, it, is, it is a lovely story. Uh, Robert Menzies, of course, with Dame Patty, his wife, um, taking part in the official procession, uh, rode in a carriage with horses. Now, carriages and horses, of course, for the official procession of the Queen's coronation were in very short supply because a lot were needed. So Robert Menzies' team sourced a carriage from the London Film Company and horses were sourced from a London brewery. Uh, but I'm sure they looked very, very good. Uh, um, Robert Menzies described in a sort of retelling of his experience of the coronation that it was a very, very cold, unusually cold June day for London, rainy. I mean, I'm not sure if that was that unusual for, for England, but anyway. Uh, and, um, and he said, you know, the carriage was fine if you closed the windows. But, of course, if you wanted to see the crowd, and particularly my constituents who were in the crowd, you needed to have the windows open. So that's what he did. And, of course, the constituents for Robert Menzies, a massive cricket fan, were particularly important because they included the Australian cricket team. So he was very happy to, to wave as he, uh, as he passed by. Uh, so tonight's debate is following the Australia-Asia Debating Guide. We have three fabulous speakers for the Yes team, Yes to the Republic, and the No team, No to the Republic. Um, I will introduce them. Uh, we have... Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Mr Nicholas Rees, welcome. Uh, Associate Professor of Law here at the Law School, William Partlett, thank you, welcome. And former Victorian convener of the Australian Republican Movement, Tristan Layton. Welcome to the Yes Team. <laughs> For the negative team, we have uh, the convener in Victoria of Australians for a Constitutional Monarchy, Jeremy Mann. Welcome, Jeremy. Uh, Michael Grono, KC. Welcome, Michael. And member for Western Victoria, Bev MacArthur. Welcome to the No Team. <laughs> Our adjudicator tonight is Rashina Campbell, sitting over there. She is a barrister and also a uh, councillor in the city of Melbourne. And I hope no bias to her Deputy Lord Mayor. <laughs> Each speaker has seven minutes to speak and I will ring a bell at six minutes. But before we start the debate, and I understand Nicholas is going to be the first speaker for the affirmative, I would like to take a quick straw poll by way of hands um, on your views on the Republic. Could those in favour of the Republic please put their hand up? Yay! One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine... 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, right. Those against a republic, please put your hands up. One, Okay. <laughs> yes, William, they are. Uh, <laughs> they're new. And those who are undecided, put your hands up. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
two, three, four, five, six. Okay, great. All right. I've tallied the figures and we will get on with the debate. Please come to the stage to the lectern, Nicholas Reese, first speaker for the affirmative. I'll be the first speaker for the affirmative this evening and I will introduce the broad arguments that we are going to be making this evening and also introduce our team. So uh, our second speaker is William Partlett, who is a constitutional law expert, and he will explain to you all why, as a constitutional monarchy, Australia is being stunted. And he will also explain why we need constitutional reform to be able to progress as an advanced democracy. Then we will hear from young Tristan Layton there, a, a, a young man with a big future in front of him who's got big ambitions for our country as well. And he will explain why, as patriots, we must embrace the Republic. And he will, of course, as our third speaker, uh, completely disassemble the nonsense on stilts that we are going to be hearing from the negative case this evening. So let me begin with our first argument, and it goes like this. No great nation ever had another nation's monarch as its head of state. No great nation ever worshipped a foreign monarch. Australia will never reach its full potential as the great nation we know we can be, while we have another country's monarch ruling over us. It's time for Australia to cut the apron strings back to the mummy country <laughs> and to assume our place as a fully-fledged grown-up, as an independent nation. <laughs> to be our own country with our own head of state. It is inappropriate and anomalous for Australia as an independent country to share the person who is our monarch with the United Kingdom. The Australian monarch is not Australian. King Charles III is British and he resides in a castle in Britain. He may be a very nice guy. I think we can all agree on that. But he cannot adequately represent Australia and Australia's national aspirations, our aspirations, either to ourselves or to the rest of the world. So long as we retain our existing system with our head of state determined essentially, essentially by the Parliament of Westminster, uh, we, can, we will not be the nation we can be. We can no longer tolerate this absurdity. We need to have one of our own as our head of state. We need a resident for president. <laughs> I will now move on to the second main argument, and that is a reflection on the role of the British monarchy here in Australia as a multicultural society. Now, I hope you will all agree that Australia is the world's most successful multicultural society. We know we're not perfect, but we do it better than any other country in the world when it comes to being an open, tolerant, welcoming, pluralistic society. And Australia's multicultural identity is an essential part of who we are today. It is one of our great strengths. Now, last week... I attended a citizenship ceremony at Town Hall, as Rashina Campbell, Councillor Campbell and I occasionally have the great honour to do. And over 200 people were there from over 50 nations, all having conferred upon them the great gift of Australian citizenship. There was Ukrainians, Syrians, Italians, Chinese, Filipinos, Americans, Swedes, Mexicans. As I said, over 50 nations represented and as part of the citizenship ceremony, they all stand up, and you know what they do? They swear allegiance to King Charles III and all his heirs and successors. And I've got to tell you, standing there at the front of the auditorium at Town Hall with the big picture of King Charles of Britain there beside me, it jars. It's like a fart at a funeral. Like, it's just completely out of place. And in my speech to those new Australians, I tell them that in this country, 
you can do anything. Unlike many of the places you have come from, in this country, you can rise to any office in the land. But, of course, I'm not being completely truthful, am I? I am not, because no Australian can be our head of state. It says so in our constitution. You can have a representative, you know, you can have the, the king's man or the king's woman, but you cannot be, as an Australian, our head of state. Now, forgive me, at this point I need to invoke the spirit of Sir Robert Menzies, who, it did, he did once say that Australia is British to our bootstraps. But he did say that a very, very, very long time ago, didn't he? And Australia has changed immeasurably since that time. And as Georgina and I have often discussed, uh, you know, uh, Sir Robert Menzies was very progressive and forward-looking in some of his views. Look what he did to uh, uh, around appointing women to positions in the Liberal Party. And I am sure that if Robert Menzies was alive today, he, in fact, would be a supporter of Australia becoming a republic. Now, I've spoken about the, I have spoken about the father of the Liberal Party. Now let me talk about the grandfather of the Liberal Party, Alfred Deakin. Now, Alfred Deakin's great mission in life was, for the, was to form the Commonwealth of Australia. He was an Australian nativist through and through. He had a strong sense of nationhood and our national destiny. And I tell you here tonight that if Alfred Deakin was alive today, he would be a supporter of the Republic as well. <coughs> Now, I will just finish by talking about, and our third argument, about how the monarchy as it stands is just not uh, consistent with current social values in this country. And there are certain key char characteristics of the monarchy that are in conflict with modern Australian values, beginning with the hereditary nature of the monarchy, which conflicts with our uh, belief in the fair go and egalitarianism that runs through Australia. We are not a nation that supports inherited, pr inherited privilege and uh, underpinning modern liberalism, it does need to be said, is the notion of reward for effort, not reward for birthright. And that's what we have with our monarchy. So, in conclusion, let me say, if you're an Australian patriot, you know we should not worship a foreign monarch. If you believe in multicultural Australia, then you know it is time for us to modernise our relationship with modern Britain. And if you believe in equality and the fair go, then you know we need one of our own, an Australian, as our head of state. Thank you very much. As the first speaker for the negative, I'd like to ask Jeremy Mann. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, it was nice to have a couple of ninth years here, uh, well, gracing us with their presence. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honour to open the case against the proposition that Australia should become a republic. The negative team's case is that constitutional monarchy is a functioning democracy system, a sound national foundation for 122 years that is still going strong today. Becoming a republic would necessitate removing the very underpinnings of our stable, multicultural and modern society and should be rejected by you all tonight. My companions and I will seek tonight to demonstrate that this system should not be replaced with, well, I mean, there was no model put up by the opposite team anyway, so I don't know what exactly we're debating against in terms of a republic, but uh, we'll try our best nonetheless. Uh, but our case tonight is twofold. And firstly, I'll argue that constitutional monarchy is a pragmatic model of government with our sovereign and governor-general's apolitical leadership and service providing various democratic dividends. I'll then make comparisons to the faults of Republican systems, namely the politicisation of the head of state, leading to a greater propensity for political instability and unrest. Mr Gronau KC will then outline the legal basis for the Crown and its relationship to the Governor-General's unique constitutional role, delineating ceremonial and substantive power and describing their complementarity. Finally, Mrs MacArthur MLC will summarise our case and rebut those arguments made by the affirmative team. I'd first like to start with the point raised by Mr Rees, was that uh, the claim that he made that there's been no great nation that's ever had another country's head of state. I mean, do we think that Australia isn't a great nation? Is that what we're claiming here tonight? Uh, that Australia isn't already an independent country that represents itself, that stands as its own two feet in the international community? Absolutely not. 
And to say that the king has no connection to Australia and has no Australian character at all. I mean, this is someone that studied in our state for two years, gained a, an appreciation for our culture, for our people, and has come back on multiple occasions. And I'm very glad that the Prime Minister has, in fact, last week invited His Majesty to come to Australia either this year or the next. The other point that was raised by those opposite was that, as a multicultural society, we shouldn't have the king as our monarch. But in fact, the monarch has just had the most diverse coronation service uh, and it has represented many faiths, many of those amongst, across the Commonwealth. And in fact, having a pluralistic society as we do in Australia, and we should be proud to, makes it important that we have an independent, apolitical and impartial head of state. And I'll also be speaking later as well about how the vice-regal appointments have actually been more diverse in both gender and in culture uh, compared to those presidents and other examples. Firstly, it's important to establish that Australia is already a fully independent and prosperous nation, with no formal political or legal ties to the United Kingdom. Our monarchy naturally has roots in our nation's British foundation, as does the English language and the Westminster system. Yet it is entirely separate from the United Kingdom, having attained an institutionally distinct character and functionality. It is grounded in a democratically approved constitution describing the sovereign of Australia, a unique title. And on the global stage, Australians are among one of 10 constitutional monarchies in the top 20 global democracies, a pretty stark figure. Our Governor-General, who is appointed by the Sovereign on the advice of the elected Prime Minister, serves as an apolitical and impartial umpire. And our Constitution is a buffer against political overreach and tyranny, with our Executive Head of State providing checks and balances upon government, most frequently by giving royal assent to legislation which, may I add, has never been refused in our nation's history. The Governor-General, a distinguished Australian, usually with a judicial or military background, embodies a strong commitment to service above self by carrying out their ceremonial and constitutional duties, including representing our nation abroad. These positive attributes would hardly be reflected in the likes of potential presidential candidates, with names such as Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull coming to mind. <laughs> Some contend that a republic would entail a shift in name only from Governor-General to President. But in fact, under a republic, the head of state would automatically become a political office. It would become beholden to popular elections and lose its essential autonomising link to the sovereign, the very link that provides the check and balance. What a duplicative, costly and risky exercise that those opposite are proposing tonight. Those pushing the republican agenda hardest are inevitably politicians, vying to give themselves and their partisan mates the top job. A republic would re rewrite our nation's strong and stable constitution according to political agendas, vested interests and financial lobbying necessitated by elections, which would be especially alarming if a constitutional crisis were to arise. Secondly, Australia should not become a republic because Australia's constitutional monarchy is a stabilising democratic and representative force that we stand to lose by changing our system. Just look at the number of female and multicultural vice-regal representatives that we've had, such as our first female governor, Linda Desso, and past governor of South Australia, Hugh Van Le, compared to a, the, the range of presidents in prominent, prominent Northern Hemisphere republics. Whilst republics often claim to be governed by the people and for the people, the outcomes are not always ideal or particularly democratic with a preponderance of civil unrest, economic stresses and political uncertainty. The example that comes to mind is France, where a president and prime minister from different political parties can lead to a state of paralysis, as described by former president Jacques Chirac, where the partisan head of state is able to dissolve parliament, call elections and, as we've seen recently, intervene in government legislation, leading to riots on the streets. Instability is present in the American context too, where presidential orders are dictated, courts are stacked with politically motivated appointees and disputed electoral outcomes lead to violence. Meanwhile, Australia's elections run smoothly, where writs are issued and returned to the Governor-General and Ministers swear allegiance to and are held accountable by an apolitical crown. In my 21 years, I have witnessed a revolving door of eight Prime Ministers and yet for the most part, only one monarch. A monarch with an extraordinary 70-year reign characterised by strong leadership and service to others, when many in the political class instead seek to tamper with the highest office in the land and install one of their own at the heart of an unstable, costly and ceremonially bereft republic. 
Any notion that we are not independent or that we are subservient to our historical ties is insulting to those who have contributed to our nation and should be rejected outright. May Australia never become a republic and may God save the King. Thank you. I'd like to introduce the second speaker for the affirmative, William Partlett. Thank you. Okay, I want to start by uh, explaining a little bit about what you might hear in my accent that you think, oh, this is an American carpetbagger arguing the case for republic. What is this about? I'm an insider-outsider in this debate. I was born in Canberra 44 years ago, uh, spent a lot of time in Australia since then, and have been teaching Australian constitutional law for eight years. So, and I also have an understanding of comparative con constitutional arrangements. So I'm, the first thing I want to do is respond to our learned con colleague here's kind of scaremongering about what could happen with a republic, right? This is, which is often, I think, really the, the kind of the main argument that the, uh, that the monarchists put forward is, isn't this scary to change everything? We might end up like France. No, but it's completely wrong. From a constitutional point of view, if we look at the Australian Republic model, for instance, uh, it is very clear that the constitutional text will make it very clear that this elected or unelected, depending on how we choose the head of state, again, that could be worked out, will be confined to the role that the governor general plays as we, as we sit today, this head of state, but it will be an Australian head of state, right? So we have no danger of semi-presidentialism a la Jacques Chirac in France. We have no danger of American-style presidentialism, which we sometimes hear thrown about. What we have is a republic model that is safe, but that is very important, Right? And that's what I really want to direct most of my uh, attention to in my seven minutes. Now, as it stands now, it is very clear that the constitutional text, if we read the Constitution of Australia, as Nick is saying, it's more than the, than the actual oath that new Australians take. It's the actual text of the Constitution talks about the importance of the Queen in Parliament in the UK giving authority to this constitutional text. What does that do? That brings in, naturally, arguments from executive power in the United Kingdom. Now, what, why is that a problem? Well, Australia is distinctive. We can start with a number of different things. One of the, perhaps the most important that I want to focus on is in Australia, we have an elected upper house. We don't have a house of lords. We don't have peers, unelected peers, sitting in our upper house. We have a fully elected upper house. And we had that over 123 years ago. So Australia's been distinctive from the beginning, yet at the moment it is being stunted by this connection right, to, to monarchy, and it's being unable to develop its distinctive approaches. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means we're unable to actually engage through litigation or through political constitutionalism, our discussions of the constitution itself, on a, on a fully Australian basis. We're held back by what some, including Jeff Lindell and others, uh, for 30, 30 years ago called the Westminster Syndrome, right? that we understand our constitutional system through the lens of Westminster, right? which, it is, which we are an outgrowth of Westminster, but we are a distinctive outgrowth of Westminster, and we have been that way for 123 years, and it is time for that to be recognized so that Australian constitutional uh, law and Australian constitutionalism can continue to develop, because I do see it as uh, at this moment as being held back by continuing arguments made that, oh, well, Westminster, they do it this way, we should do it this way as well. Right? And these arguments play in, in many different directions. Um, and in fact, one of, the, I think, the key threats that we can see is, as we see emerging threats to Australian democracy with respect to kind of majoritarian domination by the executive branch over parliament, right? as parliament starts to fade away Right? As, as executives and as premiers or prime ministers centralize power in the office of the premier, how does parliament reassert itself? Well, the argument that we're putting forward today is that parliament has reasserts itself by, assert, by playing this distinctive role that Australia has invented, where you have an upper house that is a non-party house that puts an important political check on the power of the executive. So executive managerialism, a la Scott Morrison, for instance, Dan Andrews, Right, that we see where all power is executed and kind of carried out through the office of the premier or the leader, is actually 
is undermined by Westminster principles of pure majoritarianism, right? Well, we control the lower house. We can do whatever we want. What is, so we need, the, so the discussion that is important in this, this, what is, I think the monarch is, monarchy is, is holding back in this kind of connection to Britain is an understanding of the distinctive role of these upper houses and how that deepens our values. And this is just one example. Another example we can think about as well is one of the key values of Australia is multi-confessional. Right? We have multiple faiths, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Church of England, and so forth. Now, of course, the monarch is, by law, required to be the head of the Church of England and cannot be Catholic, for instance, cannot be Muslim. Is that appropriate if we're thinking about engaging with the very center, central ideas and values? So the idea here is that we see from structural points of view, from values points of view, we, that Australian constitutional law and Australian constitutionalism and Australian democracy is being held back by a connection, a connection that during the time of Robert Menzies might have been very important, but is no longer important, and I, and I argue as actually holding us back. And if we have a safe model, right, where we can change to a, an Australian elected head of state, one that is able to represent Australians, one that we can hold accountable, right? Because if we think, what is one of the key values of Australian democracy? Holding our public officers accountable. Can we remove Charles III from power? No, right? He's, we certainly can. Now, we could, under the Australian Republic uh, models uh, approach, and I think in, a, in, a, in an Australian, monarch, in Australian Republic, we, we would have, we should have that power. Right? So it is time for Australia to embrace its democratic values and to develop its democratic values. And in so doing, really renew our form of parliamentary democracy that's distinctive and, and show and be confident in the world and show what Australia can really contribute as one of the world's leading democracies. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce the second speaker for the negative team, Michael Grono KC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, the affirmative haven't told us what model of republic they want. The reason they're not doing that is because they know that if they do, it will be obvious that it's not as good as the current system. If the affirmative wants to win the debate, the owners, they're proposing the change, they have to show that there's a republican system of government that is demonstrably better than what we already have which is the most successful system of government so far invented by humankind. No one but a complete lunatic would want to tamper with it unless they had something that was demonstrably better. They don't. It's been just put to you that to sort of minor detail whether the president's directly elected, elected by an electoral college system like in the United States, you know, say President Trump, for example, or a two-thirds majority of parliament or whatever the Australian Republican model is, perhaps the third speaker of the affirmative can explain it to me because I don't understand it at all. Now, those things actually matter, among other things, because if you have an elected president, that person might think that she or he had more of a mandate than the Prime Minister. The current Prime Minister is rightly Prime Minister because his party won the last election. He was only elected directly by the people who live in his electorate. Now, I'm perfectly happy with that system, it's a great system, but given the enormous power that's given to the Governor-General in the Constitution, I want that person to exercise it according to all the conventions. The Governor-General is also Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. As we all know, that doesn't mean the Governor-General can wake up tomorrow morning and decide to invade New Zealand, for example. And the reason for that is because all those powers have to be exercised on advice. That's why the system works. You have to be very careful about changing such a system because the devil is in the detail. Now, the US Constitution was drafted by some terribly clever people like Jefferson and Madison and all sorts of other clever people. It is currently dysfunctional because it's stuck in the 18th century and it doesn't have any sort of implied powers. It's wholly written. I would suggest to you that great a country as America is, our system of government is demonstrably better than theirs and we certainly shouldn't be moving to that kind of republic. But I say that the, it's up to the affirmative to give us the detail and tell us what model of republic they put forward and I would suggest that they cannot do so. My lefty friends sometimes ask me why I'm in favour of constitution monarchy over republic and they say this more in sorrow than anger. The short answer is because it really works very well. 
And the suggestions that Australia is somehow deficient or not a real nation or not a great country are, in my humble submission, complete nonsense. There are literally millions of people all over the world who would desperately like to come and live here. That's because Australia is a very successful country. And when we're talking about other countries with similar systems, I think immediately of New Zealand and Canada. I've always thought if, say, I've been exiled from Australia for some reason or other, then they'd probably be my next two choices to live. While we're on Constitution 1, we've got Japan, we've got Denmark, we've got Norway, we've got Sweden, we've got the Netherlands. Again, all fairly desirable countries that a lot of people would literally give their eye teeth to live in. I remember years ago, before the 1999 referendum, going to a seminar with the late Frank Knopfelmarker, whom you might remember taught here, was no respecter of persons. Now, he was an Eastern European Jewish Holocaust survivor. And when somebody said, oh, the, crowns, no, the current system's no longer relevant because it's multicultural, Frank, who'd come here as a refugee after the war, said, don't you understand it is because of your British institutions that we chose to come here. The great thing about Australia is we can choose the good things about Britain without the bad things, like, for example, the aristocracy and the class system. Now, of course, Britain's made mistakes, so is Australia. Our system is self-correcting. And all the mistakes have been made, in, in, seen in the recent past in Australia, by politicians we elected, rightly or wrongly. And that's the point about democracy. Now, my view, I agree with Winston Churchill, it's the worst system of government ever invented, except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. But the point is it is self-correcting. Our system works better than any other kind of democracy. And I've been saying this to Republicans for 30 years. Tell us the republic overseas that's better governed than Australia. I have yet to have a satisfactory answer. So what I'm saying to you tonight is that the system we've got works very well. We know how it works. Unlike the US system, it can evolve over time. So it's fitted for the 21st century rather than the 17th or the 18th. And um, it is also a system that's responsive and it gives us better quality people than you would get elected. And my friend uh, Jeremy's already pointed that out. If you look at, say, if you want to talk about multiculturalism, now, the US has had two non-Protestant presidents since you know, 1789. If you look at our last three governors in Victoria, the current one was born here, but she's the daughter of Polish Holocaust survivors. The previous one was born in Lithuania. The one before that was born in Sri Lanka. Now, none of those sorts of people would stand for election as a president or a state governor or whatever the Republicans would call it. Similarly, if you look at our recent governors general, none of those people would stand for election. They're not the sort of people you'd get. You would get someone, you know, like the sort of people who stand for election in republics like Mr Macron, love him or hate him, or Donald Trump or someone like that. And so that's why I say to you that we should be very proud of our country the way it is. It is one of the most desirable countries to live in anywhere in the world. The system already works very well. We are a successful multicultural society. And in particular, Charles is the, is the king... But the de facto role of head of state in Australia is played by the Governor-General and the state governors, and I would suggest to you they do it pretty well and a lot better than a president elected under any kind of system you care to name. And the affirmative have not put forward any details about any system whatsoever, and I would suggest to you the devil is very much in the detail if you want to do start with constitutional tinkering. Our constitution is very hard to amend. That We've had 44 goes and we've got up, the amendments have got up eight times. That's as it should be. Constitutions should be hard to amend. If you look at countries where they amend it all the time, they're not as good as us. So I would ask you to stick with what we've got because it works, and in particular, it works better than any alternative that anyone else has yet to put up. Thank you. Uh, I would like to call uh, upon the third speaker for the affirmative, Tristan Layton. Thank you, Tristan. <clears throat> Hi everyone, playing a lovely little timer on, so you'll forgive me, I'm on the recovery end of what they call the man flu, so if I break into a sudden bout of coughing, that's what that is about. Um, so good evening everyone, uh, tonight we've heard some very interesting arguments put forward uh, from both sides, I think more interesting on my side, but that's just me. Um, the case I want to make to you tonight is very straightforward and it's about Australian independence and about Australian independence being the next stage of the Australian national project. And I'm also cognisant of the rules which I haven't yet used since high school debating about introducing new material, so I'll be very careful not to do that. Uh, but on that said, I just want to make it very clear that I am motivated primarily by optimism 
and pride in our country and motivated by pride in our people and a belief in our capacity for independence. So our good friend Michael makes some points about the model and I'm going to give a very unsatisfactory answer to that, which is that it is secondary. I know that's very uninteresting, but it's very easy to get caught up in the minutiae of the model. And this is what our opponents on this side love to do. Most of the, I've had a handful of these debates, and generally the way they go is we make these broad pictures about identity and who we are as a country and moving forward. And our opponents make a lot of weedy arguments about who said what in 1901 and all that sort of stuff. But we seek to really have this discussion on identity because the other side don't want to talk about identity. They don't want to have to admit that Australia is, in their view, still a British nation and should remain so forever and ever. Amen. It's a lot easier to get caught up in these things and to get caught up in, you know, how, what is the role of the Governor-General and are they the head of state? Are we independent or are we not? What about the Australia Act? It's secondary. The reality is we have a foreign head of state in the heart of our constitution and he is foreign and I know that is controversial to some people to say that a man resident in Britain is foreign. Uh, but he is. Uh, my colleague Jeremy makes some very interesting points about religion and multiculturalism and I would like to reiterate what my colleague William said about the fact that it's, it's quite curious that in a multicultural society as diverse and interfaith as Australia where we have such a diverse range of faiths that we are permanently governed by a man who just so happens to coincidentally be the leader of the Church of England. Now I'm not a member of the Church of England I have no disrespect towards members of the Church of England or the Catholic Church or of any faith. But I feel very lucky that we have provisions in our constitution that ensure that there can be no test for relig or religious test for an office. This is something that my colleague William, who coincidentally is my former constitutional law professor, um, could probably test me on what number section that's actually found in, and I would fail. Uh, <laughs> but we are very lucky that we live in a very liberal, positive liberal democracy where we respect freedom of religion and freedom of belief and speech and culture and these things are all very wonderful and I think very fundamental Australian values. Uh, Jeremy raises a very interesting point as well about independence and this is the question that comes up a lot. I would say that unfortunately we are not an independent country. We feel like one. We should be an independent country. For all intents and purposes, sometimes it feels like we are but we're not because at the heart of our constitution we are so deeply ingrained with the British model. And let me explain to you just the extent of this sycophancy, and it is sycophancy that we are begging for the attention of our head of state who just happens to live in another country. So I've recently learned about uh, some, and I won't introduce new material, so just thought I'd flag that very quickly, but the extent to which we swear allegiance to the foreign monarch. It's not only our members of parliament who don't swear allegiance to serve us, the people who represent them, but to be faithful and bear, bear true allegiance to his majesty and it was quite embarrassing and no offence Bev of course but it was quite embarrassing to see the Victorian state MPs get rushed back to parliament when the king uh, when the queen passed away because uh, god forbid he would ever question their loyalty for even a second so it was very curious to watch them all run back to parliament and reaffirm uh, their undying love for his majesty. Uh, our friends on the other side are also right to note the strength of our conventions and we are very fortunate to live in a country with very strong constitutional conventions. But I believe where our opponents are mistaken is that it's very easy to confuse convention with tradition. And conventions cannot, or I think something that our opponents often put forward is this proposition that conventions can only come from the crown. But the crown is very, very old. The crown is thousands of years old. Our country is quite young. And every convention in our parliamentary democracy developed organically with influences from abroad but developed organi organically over the last 120 years. And conventions exist in every form of government, and every parliamentary republic out there in the world, Ireland, Germany, Iceland, Israel, is bound by convention. And Israel is a very interesting topic that I will try not to get sidetracked by, because that's a country that right now is going through a democratic situation. Uh, but thankfully for them, they are held up by very strong conventions of a robust, independent head of state. And, and I'm not going to get into the model as much as it's very tempting to get into the model. I will not. But convention, I just very, want to be very clear about this, is convention does not mean stasis. Convention doesn't mean inertia. The monarchy itself has adapted over many years and changed its form. Why can't we? So I, and I think I would also like to, to state, my friend Jeremy mentions that uh, King Charles has profound love for an Australian, and that's all very well and good. I personally am not impressed by the fact that he's visited his royal Antipodean subjects in Australia a whopping 16 times, I believe. 
Uh, this to me evinces the same level of connection to our continent as a British backpacker. I would also note that he's visited his subjects in Canada 18 times. But more importantly, it saddens me that we have to beg for his attention. It saddens me that we have to beg for the attention of our own head of state. Won't he please come visit his subjects down here on the other side of the world? It's very sad. But I would put forward that if our head of state is to be chosen from the alumni of Geelong Grammar, I would much rather it be Sam Newman, because at least his gaudy Pamela Anderson house is only a few minutes down the road. But I don't want to have discussions about how much our monarch does or doesn't love our country, because it is a roll of the dice. We have no say. A really truly Australian value I love is that we have this innate discomfort with authority, with the British ideas of lords and dukes and barons, and the American ideas where they worship successful individuals. That's not us. We don't bend the knee, we don't kiss the ring. In my experience working in the Australian Republic movement, I've been so impressed by how many young people are so deeply and profoundly just and believe in these principles of equity and fairness. And more importantly, they're optimistic. They, unlike my opponents, believe in the capacity of the Australian people to be independent. They believe that we can govern ourselves. They believe that we are mature enough and we're old enough and we're wise enough to govern ourselves and manage our own affairs. And I will wrap up on that point. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to call upon the final speaker, the third speaker for the negative, Bev MacArthur. Thanks, Bev. Well, thank you, Georgina, and thank you to the Menzies Institute for putting on this debate tonight, and thank you all for coming. And what a great idea this is to debate this very important topic. And I feel sorry for Nicholas. I'm sorry. He seems to have some sort of chip on his shoulder. He didn't like to be photographed next to King Charles III. Perhaps he should have been had his photograph uh, there in, in, in full size, Nicholas. So I don't have a chip on my shoulder. I'm a very proud Australian, and I think we have developed this country under a constitutional monarchy very successfully. And why else would all these thousands and millions of people want to come to this country to make it home? Why would they want to become citizens, Nicholas, in this constitutional monarchy? Because it's so successful. We are a successful multicultural democracy. And you destroyed your own argument, Nicholas, because you said how successful we were. We are successful. Um, and Tristan, look, I'm really sorry you've still got to fight for the young constitutional monarch. So, you know, no, come and join us. You know, you're failing over there in the Republic side. But look, the worst thing you can do, I can say, is give more power to politicians. You know, uh, that, that's what we don't want. Believe me, I spend my day job trying to get politicians out of our lives. You know, if they, if they, they find a system, they want to tinker with it. They want to do something. They've always got to do something, and usually it's with your money. And they'll regulate you further. So the last thing we need is this potential model where, where politicians are going to decide from all over the country who on earth we might have as some elected head of state. Goodness me, uh, as, as Paul Keating said, let me quote that fine man, uh, Australia is safer and better with the diffuse and representative power structure it currently enjoys. Paul Keating said that. Uh, we have a great system of democracy here and we've not heard how they can do it better. That's the problem with your argument. Uh, we have a system that works. It works very well. The parliament is sovereign, not the head of state in Britain that you're so concerned about. Quite frankly, they, they do it very well. They're quite cheap, Nicholas. So I'm very worried if you had an elected president, we'd have some despot that said, goodness me, I'll promise you something, but I'll buy it with your money. That's the problem with uh, elected presidents. You know, we've... How about the system that operates in Russia and China, for example? We can't possibly think that that's any better. Um, so we, we have a great system. We've, uh, we've, it's developed very well under the constitutional monarchy. Uh, the Governor-General, as head of state, any Australian can aspire to be the Governor-General, and they have. 
but I doubt those governor generals and governors that we've had would have been elected under, under a Republican system. Uh, also, they don't need money to become uh, a governor or a governor general, but certainly you do uh, in, in a republic uh, system. Look, look what happens in America, how much money that requires to become uh, the president. Uh, it, it's extraordinary. So what we have on your side... Sorry, gentlemen. Gent the only gentlemen over there. Um, uh, is, in fact, constitutional vandalism. That's what we've got over there. Uh, and worse, it's driven by guilt. Uh, the self-lacerating Chardonnay socialists who, who, from the ABC who think it's, you know, the, we're evil, we're rotten as a people, rotten as a nation. No, we're not. We're fabulous. Uh, I'm a proud Australian. I think everybody is. And how come we are a proud Australians? Because we've operated under a constitutional monarchy. How good is that? Uh, and, <laughs> obviously, obviously, Nicholas, your publicity machine is failing dismally. <laughs> uh, get, get a new social media expert, ask Dan. He's got plenty. Um, uh, we're not defined uh, by race, religion or culture, but by shared values of freedom, democracy, the rule of law and equality, and the opportunity of a fair go. It's paramount in our constitutional monarchy system. And our current system has evolved precisely because of our existing system. It works, and it works uh, more in an Australian way. Uh, like us, it has inherited aspects, but time and experience have shaped it uh, to fit us like a glove. Nothing from the proposition tonight has convinced me we should ditch our intricate, inherited, evolved constitution in favour of an intellectually designed, politician-driven jump in the dark. Uh, every argument we've heard from the proposition has been based on emotion and feeling. I'm terribly sorry you've got this chip on your shoulder. Uh, but the fact is, no political system is perfect. We've heard about that tonight, and we see it across the world, but our system is strong, stable, pragmatic and fair. It's uniquely Australian and, frankly, is pretty bloody good. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bev, and to all the speakers tonight. Um, while Rashina, our adjudicator, makes her determination of who won the debate, I wondered if we might do another poll just to see if anyone's shifted, changed their mind or the dial has shifted at all in favour of the Republic or, or has it consolidated in favour of retaining our current system? So all those... In favour of the Republic, could you please raise your hand really high so I can see it? Keep going. 10, okay. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Unchanged. Yes. Uh, all those. In favour of retaining the constitutional monarchy. Mm. 38, up five. Undecided. Anyone still? Just one. Oh, two. Two. Okay. So if we, if we were to hold a referendum on the basis of this crowd, it would, be, it would be a hard no, I'm afraid. But we're not. We are not because we're leaving it to... Yeah, in favour of 
the monarchy. Yeah, I'm afraid. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Nicholas. Um, sorry, I'll tell you the number. So we started off 16 yes, 33 no, and six undecideds. Um, and we have ended up 16 yes, 38 no, two undecideds. I can say we've lost an individual, so anyway. Yes, probably one of the secret socialists. <laughs> uh, but we will actually leave the decision up to Rashina Campbell. Rashina, please. Well, can I start by thanking Georgina for her fantastic work here at the Robert Menzies Institute and to her and her team for organising a wonderful debate. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> When Georgina asked me to adjudicate, I have to say I was first delighted because I knew it would be an intellectually rigorous evening, and it has been that. I knew it would be entertaining. I didn't know just quite how dramatic, but I, I thank the speakers for handling it with the poise they did, particularly the Deputy Lord Mayor. And then I had a look at the speakers list, and I have to say I was a little bit nervous. On the one hand, as a councillor, I had my superior, the Deputy Lord Mayor, on the team over here. And in my day job as a barrister, I had a, a King's Council in Jeremy Grono, or Michael Grono over here. So perhaps I was picked because I was clearly going to be impartial with two superiors on either side of the team, or perhaps just because I was a university debating tragic. But either way, I'm delighted to be here. It has been a very intellectually rigorous debate, but ultimately I think it's come down to this question. The character of the nation and whether having a monarchy reflects that versus the stability of government and what the monarchy has provided. And we had a, a bit of a difficulty around that because, and I completely understand why this was the case given how the last referendum on this issue played out, the affirmative didn't put up a model. Now, politically that makes sense given what happened in the last referendum and tactically seemed like a good move. Until the negative took to the podium and made this point no model was put up because there was no model that the affirmative could put up that would prove to be better than the system we currently have in place. And this was a theme that carried through the negative speakers. And they sort of had history on their side, over 122 years of stability in this country. And the success of this nation, a point that the Deputy Lord Mayor made at the start, we are the greatest multicultural success, success story in the world. There's a reason people choose to come here, and one of those reasons is the stability of our government. So they were two factors that were significantly in the favour of the negative. Ultimately, though, this was a really well-reasoned debate and was pretty close. I found in favour of the negative, though, for the points that I've just referred to. Ultimately, the stability of government point was one that was backed up by history, backed up by the inability to point to examples of a more successful system of government, and the ability to point to many successful constitutional monarchies around the world, the fact that people choose to come here for our stability. But then looking at this issue of the character of our country, does a monarchy where our head of state isn't a resident? Would we prefer a resident for president? I think this is a really important point, and we're probably at a point in our nation's history where it's worth having that debate again. But again, it was a point that was probably quite successfully undermined by the negative. And they raised the question, what is the likelihood that we would have a more diverse president than the sorts of people we've seen appointed, particularly to the role of Governor of Victoria? The last three appointments suggest quite impressive diversity and the risk of politicising that role, either through direct elections or through allowing our politicians to choose the head of state, those risks were risks that couldn't really be countered by the affirmative that still shied away from choosing a model. So ultimately, with a margin of 10 points, which I've taken the debating guide that Georgina referred me to, so I've marked on method, manner and, meth and um, matter, by 10 points, I've awarded it to the negative tonight. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Rashina, for the adjudication and incredibly insightful comments. Um, I think we all have drawn our own conclusions one way or the other. I, for one, thought um, all speakers did an absolutely marvellous job. 
particularly in the face of some intense opposition from outside the room as well. Uh, and um, I really do appreciate the time you've taken to make this such, a, such an interesting evening and, and also remind us that there are some really big questions ahead of us, no doubt, in the coming years. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.